Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Welcome to St. Paul's. For those of you who don't know, my name is Keith. I'm on staff here at the church, and it's uh, great to be here worshiping with you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this week, Pastor Ryan's going to be continuing his uh, series in the parables. If you missed the first two, they were excellent, uh, according, uh, in my opinion. And uh, you should, uh, you could check them out if you weren't here for it. There's a, we have a podcast, we have a YouTube channel, we also have a Facebook page. So there's multiple ways you could see any of our past sermons and uh, get connected. And when you miss, you can always catch up. So uh, I encourage you to do that this morning. On your way in, everyone should have got a, a connection card, possibly a Bible if you want. Uh, if not, uh, there are some in the back. There's also some on your table. We ask everyone every week to fill these out. Just a great way to let us know you were here worshiping with us. There's a place for uh, interest if you have any interest here at St. Paul's. And then on the back, there's a place for your prayers and your praises. And we have a prayer team who prays over these cards each and every week. And we love to be praying for you. So uh, be encouraged to do that. Then you can stick them in the offering basket on your way out this morning. If you are joining us on live stream, welcome to you as well. Uh, we have a virtual connection card in the comment section. Feel free to click on that and you can uh, be able to fill one out as well and let us know how we could be praying for you this week. Well, in a few moments we're going to be worshiping the Lord through music and uh, like I said, through Pastor Ryan's sermon. But before we do that, we do just have a couple quick announcements. Our first announcement is this uh, thir Tuesday, October 19th, 6.45 is our monthly documentary uh, night. We did this uh, last month. It was great. We had a great discussion afterwards. And uh, this week, we're, we're going to be doing the same thing. It's going to be happening on the third Tuesday of every month. This week is called For the Love of God. And it's how the church is, is better and worse than you ever imagined. So uh, Pastor Ryan it doesn't really have a rating. We gave it a rating of PG-13. So if you'd like to bring your teenagers or, or uh, young adults, please feel, to, feel free to bring them as well. And again, uh, it'll be downstairs in our cafe. And it's just... It's a good time to fellowship with others, get to meet some other people in our community, and also talk about a really important issue going on right now uh, with the church. So uh, that's, again, this Tuesday, 6.45. We'll probably get the documentary started around 7. Uh, the next announcement is next Tuesday, October 26th. We're going to be having another praise and worship night. Uh, for those of you who were here the first time, you know it was just a really intimate night. A uh, great time to kind of just uh, get alone with God and listen to some great music and pray and um, Pastor Ryan pitched on there if you want to bring your, your books and study, if you like to have background music while you're studying, it's a great opportunity to do that. It's a great setting down in our cafe, and that's next Tuesday night. And then uh, for my final announcement, I'm going to call up Martha Neeson. Uh, we have small groups going on this fall. If that's something you're interested in, uh, please feel free to let us know. Pastor Ryan's email is behind me, ryan at stpaulswire.org. And then Martha is going to talk a little bit about her uh, specific small group what she has planned, if uh, anyone's interested, and then she's going to be praying for our service today and our community. Good morning, church. I hope you can hear me. Awesome. Okay, so, yeah, I'm going to be leading a small group this fall that I'd like to invite all of you to come to. We're going to be studying a book called The Sacred Romance, which is a book I read about 10 years ago that my college friend told me about, and I reread it this summer. I, the, um, the quote I want to, there's lots of really awesome quotes in here, and it's such a good book. It's really influenced my spirituality, and it really explains the Holy, um, the Trinity in a way that is a way I've never, I could never really understand the Trinity, and this book really explained it in a, in a way that I could really understand. Uh, a quote by Os Oswald Chambers is, there's only one being who can satisfy the last aching abyss of the human heart, and that is the Lord Jesus. And I just say hallelujah to that. And all of you, probably most of you know Angelina and Misha. You know they have a son, Luke. Well, Angelina and I are friends on Facebook, and she, his birthday was a couple weeks ago. And um, she put a post on it, and she said, what Luke looks forward to is when we come home every day and he can be with us and be intimate with us. And I just thought, wow, that's so beautiful. That's just how God is with us. And that's what this book is about. So if anybody's interested in studying it, let me know after service. Okay, so now we're going to pray together. I just want to share one scripture. First, 
1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay, will you join me in prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we praise your holy name. We love you so much, and we're so thankful that we belong to you, that we are your children, and that we are and that we belong to each other, Lord. Our hearts are full of joy because we belong to you. Lord, I lift up to you Lisa Laurie, a dear Christian sister in this church, and I pray that you would open up the doors for her to get a liver transplant. I pray, Father, that you would sustain her and give her strength in the in-between time. And Lord, we give you praise for Megan Maluski that her shoulder has greatly improved. And we pray, Lord, that you could give her a full range of motion. Lord, I also pray for dear Gladys France, another dear sister in the Lord. We pray, Father, that you would give her grace and strength and comfort as she adjusts to a new normal without, without her husband. But knowing she'll see him again someday, which is wonderful. Lord, we also pray for John Eklund, that... Um, that you would be with him. We thank you, Father, that he has finished his chemotherapy, and we pray, Father, that his health will continue to improve. And, Father, we also give you praise for Will and um, Lexi, who are friends of Josh Carew, that they found housing. And, Lord, we ask for, that you would be with the country of Haiti, Lord, that you would bring healing to that country. And we pray especially for 17 um, United States missionaries who were kidnapped, including missionary children. We ask, Lord God, that the kidnappers would uh, return them and that your name would be glorified. And we pray for their safety, Lord. And Lord, last but not least, we pray for today, for our service. We pray for Pastor Ryan, that you would bless him as he shares what he studied. And we're so thankful, Lord, for Ryan and for his ability to teach. And Lord, we love you and ask that you would be with us now and fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, St. Paul's. Ask you to rise as you're able and join us today in worship. Great are you, Lord. Mighty in strength, you are faithful, you'll ever be. We will praise you for all of our days. It's for your glory we offer everything. Raise your hands, all your nations. Shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord Most High. We will praise you together, now and forever. How awesome is the Lord Most High. Where you send us, God, we will go. You're the reason we want the world to know. We will trust you when you call our name. Where you lead us, we'll follow all the way. Raise your hand. All your nations shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord Most High! We will praise you together now and forever. How awesome is the Lord Most High! How awesome is the Lord most 
Shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord Most High. We will praise you together, now and forever, how awesome is the Lord Most High. The Lord Most High, the Lord Most High. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the Lord Most High, the Lord Most High. How awesome is the Lord Most High. I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair, and tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me Behold Him there, the risen Lamb my perfect spotless righteousness The great unchangeable I am The King of glory and of grace One with Himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by His blood My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with Himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by His blood, my life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God Please be seated.
All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we dive into the message, I just want to reiterate one of the announcements, which you might have been here for it, but uh, this Tuesday, we are going to have our second monthly documentary discussion night, and uh, we're going to be watching a movie called For the Love of God, How the Church is Better and Worse Than You Ever Imagined. And I thought this one might be a good one to, to watch right now because, you know, we live in a time where um, a lot of the ugly stuff from church history is coming to light and being discussed quite a bit. Um, racism, colonialism, religiously motivated violence, uh, corruption among church leadership, that kind of thing. And in the midst of that, you know, some people are asking, well, is the church even worthwhile? You know, would we have been better off if, in history if the church had never come to be? And what this documentary tries to do is to be very honest about the ugly parts of church history while also making a case for all of the ways that the church has been a blessing uh, throughout history as well. So I think it will be very thought-provoking. I think it will generate some good discussion. And so I really encourage you, if you're free this Tuesday night, uh, to come out. We're planning on gathering at 645. We'll start the movie around 7. So if you can make it, I really encourage you uh, to be there. All right, so this is week three in our series on the parables from the Gospel of Luke. And this week, we're going to look at what's called the parable of the great banquet. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to make your way to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14. Now, before we read this parable, we're going to do a, a fair amount of setting the table. Um, I, I think it's important for us to recognize the context in which Jesus shares his parables. You might remember that last week, we recognize that when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, the context was that he was answering a question, right? Which was, who is my neighbor? And knowing that really influences the way that we understand a parable like that. And similarly, with this parable, we really got to know what led Jesus to say it, what the surrounding circumstances were. In this case, the parable is not an answer to a question, but it is a response to a comment, a comment at a dinner party uh, made by a certain kind of person. So let's look at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, chapter 14, before we do, let me say a quick prayer for us. Lord, we thank you again so much for this morning. We thank you for the chance to gather around the scriptures and around your table. And Lord, we invite you to move among us, to work in our hearts and our minds. Lord, we open ourselves up to receive whatever it is that you want to say to us. Uh, Lord, help us to uh, put aside our, our concerns right now, our worries, our distractions, and just attend to you. In Jesus' name, amen. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. So it's the Sabbath day, and somehow Jesus has ended up at this Pharisee dinner party. If you're not familiar with the Pharisees at all, uh, they were the religious elites of the time. And if you know anything about the stories uh, about Jesus' life and ministry, you know that the religious elites did not like Jesus, right? Jesus said things that were very critical of them, and they saw Jesus as a threat, a threat to their power, so much so that they eventually arranged to kill him, which, of course, they were successful at for about three days. Um, so anyway, Jesus is at this Pharisee dinner party. I'm not sure how that happened. Maybe he went to the synagogue to worship and ended up in some post-worship service conversation, and things just, you know, went from there. He ended up at their their home to eat. 
And uh, whatever the case, he's there, and he is not avoiding controversial topics. He is just diving right into them. You know, in, uh, in about a month or so, many of us will gather with our extended families for Thanksgiving. And uh, most of us are going to try to avoid controversial topics, which I, I recommend, generally. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but Jesus is not avoiding them. He is just going for it, diving right in. So first, he notices uh, that one man at the gathering has a health condition. It's described as an abnormal swelling of the body. It was probably some kind of edema. And, you know, Jesus knows that he has the power to heal this man. But he also knows that the Pharisees have a policy which is no healing on the Sabbath. Um, you know, the Torah said you should treat the Sabbath as a day of rest. And of course, Jesus agreed with that. But the Pharisees had constructed all these extra rules and prohibitions to make sure that nobody got anywhere close to doing anything resembling work on the Sabbath. And so Jesus did not appreciate or agree with their interpretation of Torah, and he sees in this moment an opportunity to confront their false interpretation. Jesus thought the Pharisees had missed the original intent of God's command. They had turned the Sabbath into a burden rather than a blessing because of all these rules. And so when Jesus saw this man's condition, he thought, oh, this is a good opportunity to make a statement here. So Jesus asks them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And we're told that they don't say anything. Now, why don't they say anything? Well, the text doesn't tell us, so I think we have to read between the lines a little bit. But I have to guess, if I had to guess, I would say that um, their reasoning went something like this. Well, we, we really want Bob to get healed, <laughs> And uh, this is an opportunity for Bob to get healed. And maybe if we say, oh, it's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath, well, then Bob's going to miss his chance to be healed. Right? At the same time, they don't want to say, oh, it is lawful to heal on the Sabbath, because they've been saying for a long time that it's not. And so that would make them look inconsistent. And so they, they can't bring themselves to say anything. They're just silent. So Jesus heals the man. And then he asks another question. He says, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? Now Jesus is asking that question knowing that the Pharisee's answer would be yes. Of course. Of course we would make an exception if our child or our ox was in danger. If they were suffering, we would make an exception. So what Jesus is doing here is he is exposing both the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and their lack of compassion. Because if they would make an exception for their own child or their own ox, why wouldn't they make an exception for this man who's suffering at the dinner party or anybody else who might be suffering on the Sabbath? So Jesus is calling them out for focusing on the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. But that's not all. Okay? Jesus keeps confronting. He keeps challenging. He keeps going for the controversial topics. In the next verse, verse 7, we're told that Jesus notices that the Pharisees have all tried to get the spots of honor at the dinner table. Now, that's probably a little hard for us to, to uh, appreciate because... When we gather for dinners, there aren't like specific seats that are special places of honor. But in those days, when you went to a dinner party, where you sat at the table had a lot of significance in representing how special you were, how, how honorable you were. And what, what Jesus does here is he says, you know, when you go to a party, you shouldn't be seeking the places of honor. That shouldn't be what's, what you're all about. You shouldn't be concerned, so wrapped up in your own glory and that sort of thing. 
And then he, he continues, and this time he, he talks directly to the host, which again, this is really bold, right? You go to a, din a dinner party and now you're, you're confronting the host. And he says, when you host a dinner, you should invite the kind of people who are poor and incapable of ever returning the favor. They're described as the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You shouldn't just be inviting these honor-seeking religious elites who seek the places of, of honor at the table. You should be inviting the kind of people who could never repay you with another dinner party. So the way that I would put this is it's kind of like Jesus has ended up at the cool kids' table, and rather than trying to fit in and laugh at all their jokes, he tells them that they're not as cool as they think they are, and that there should be some other kinds of people sitting at this table, too. So all of this is the context for the parable that we're about to hear, the parable of the great banquet. Now, you may have noticed this whole time we haven't heard a single Pharisee say anything, right? <laughs> no words from the Pharisees, just confrontation and challenge from Jesus. But we're about to hear one Pharisee say something. This is the comment that prompts the parable. When one of the Pharisees hears Jesus talk about the resurrection of the, of the righteous, Jesus says, if, if you really want to be blessed, you should invite the kinds of people that you wouldn't ordinarily invite to a party. And he says, at the resurrection of the righteous, you, would, you will be rewarded for doing this. When one of the Pharisees hears Jesus talk about the resu re resurrection of the righteous, he says, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. In other words, oh yeah, that resurrection of the righteous, that is going to be so great when that happens. That moment at the end of history when the good people are rewarded, oh, that's going to be fantastic. And then Jesus tells the parable. All right, so let's look at it. Starting in verse 16. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So clearly this parable is a warning, right? A man says, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus responds by telling a parable about some people who miss out on a feast. So it's a warning. And of course what Jesus is hinting at, and not so subtly, is that the people at this dinner party are in danger of missing out on the feast in the kingdom of God. Why are they in danger of missing out? Well, here's one thing to recognize. Okay? If the parable is any indication, they're not missing out because they haven't been invited. They have been invited. The reason they're missing out is because they won't come to the party. Right? Now, why won't they come? Well, in the parable, the people offer excuses for why they can't be there. Right? So, the first said... I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Really? You must go and see it. 
What, is there a chance it's going to get up and walk away? <laughs> you already bought it. It's yours. Can't you wait a little while before admiring your new property? Seems like not a very good excuse. And then the second said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Again, what kind of excuse is this? Right? The oxen have already been purchased. Obviously, somebody else is taking care of them. He doesn't say, I need to go and feed them. He says, I need to go try them out. Right? Can't you wait a little longer to try them out? And then there's the third excuse. I just got married, so I can't come. I think this one might be the best one. You know, you're <laughs> s settling into your, your new life, right? Uh, in those days, newlywed men were exempt from military service for a year. But they weren't exempt from social gatherings. So this excuse really isn't that great either. And these excuses are especially bad when we understand something about the way invitations worked in those days, which was that there were two parts to the invitation. The first invitation was when someone came out and said, hey, there's going to be a banquet. Are you going to come? And people would say, yes or no. And then, once the enormous task of arranging the meal was completed, servants would be sent out to go and gather the people and say, hey, party's ready, come. So it's not the first invitation that's being turned down here. It's the second invitation. These people already said that they were going to come to the party. But instead of coming, they give these lame excuses. And you can see the host is really angry about these excuses, which is appropriate. I mean, can you imagine if you're planning a wedding... And you do all that work of sending out the invitations with the RSVPs. And people tell you, we're going to come. And they you know, check the box that says chicken or fish or whatever. And, and then you order the food. You, you pay the caterer. You, you do all the work of setting everything up. And then a week before the wedding, people start calling you and saying, hey, I bought some land and I want to go look at it. I bought a new car, and I just I want to drive it around. I don't know. I would be pretty annoyed. I, I would feel pretty disrespected in that situation. That's basically what's happening here. You know, these excuses are terrible. They're so bad. I, I think that it would have been better if they just used the classic excuse that Phoebe used in Friends. Oh, I wish I could, but I don't want to. That would be the honest answer, right? It's not that these people can't go to the party. It's that they just don't want to, right? They prefer to look at their property and test drive their shiny new oxen. <laughs> they prefer to stay home. So what is Jesus saying through this story? What he's saying is that the Pharisees are in danger of missing out on the kingdom of God because they just don't want to be there. They just don't want to be there. Now, you might object. You might say, well, hold on here. Of course they want to be there. Of course they do. I mean, that Pharisee, he did just say, blessed is the one who will feast at the banquet in the kingdom of God, right? He knows that that's the place anyone in their right mind would want to be. But actions speak louder than words. And the Pharisees' actions have demonstrated that they aren't really interested in the kingdom of God. Now, how do we know that? Well, for one thing, because Jesus is the kingdom of God personified. The kingdom of God come to earth in the flesh, and they have been rejecting him ever since he started his ministry. So much so that when they've witnessed Jesus doing miracles in front of them, do you know what they said? They said, oh, it's by the power of the devil that he's doing these things, that he's healing people and, and driving out demons. That's, how, that's where he's getting his power. 
See, Jesus was like the servant in the parable, inviting the Pharisees to the banquet. Come to the banquet. Come and feast in the kingdom of God. But the Pharisees were saying, eh, I, we're, you know, we're not interested. You know, they claim that the reason that they weren't interested is because they thought Jesus was actually a bad guy. But deep down, I don't think they really thought that. The reason they rejected Jesus is because they weren't really interested in the kingdom of God. What they were interested in was their own kingdoms. That's why they sought the places of honor at the table, right? That's why they only invited the other religious elites to their parties. That's why they objected to Jesus healing people on the Sabbath. Why? Because they were really interested in their own power, their own privilege, their own honor, their own glory, their own kingdom. That's what they were excited about. And Jesus was warning them, if you keep this up, you are going to miss out on the party. There's something else that Jesus is doing through this parable. He's letting the Pharisees know that there's going to be a lot of people feasting in the kingdom of God that they would never expect to be there. Remember, the host orders the servant, go out into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Now, why were these people in the streets and alleys? The reason they were there is because they had to beg to survive. They had to be out in the streets every day, hoping that someone would be generous enough to them to give them money so that they can keep eating, keep living. They weren't able to work in those days. And so these were the kind of people who could not return a favor. If you invited them to a dinner party, they were never going to invite you to theirs because they're never going to have a dinner party. Not only that, but these were the kind of people that were thought of as cursed by God in those days. I know that's very sad, but we have to acknowledge that that's the way it was. There's a, a moment in one of the Gospels where the disciples see a man who is born blind. And they say to Jesus, who, was, who sinned that this man should be born blind? Was it him? Or was it his parents? Right? So they just have this assumption. If somebody has that kind of handicap, it must be because God is mad at them. That's the way they thought that the, the world works. Right? So, now just so you know, Jesus immediately dismisses that assumption. He goes, oh, neither this man nor his parents were born blind. He shifts the attention to something else. But that was the way that people thought of the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame in those days. If you are that way, it's because God's got a problem with you. Of course you're not going to be feasting in the kingdom of God. Because clearly you did, you did something wrong to be in that position. And so when Jesus tells this parable about this host wanting these kinds of people at his banquet... Jesus is saying that God welcomes people into the kingdom who a lot of people think he never would. That God invites people into his kingdom who can't offer anything in return. That God invites people of low status, people in poverty, the outcasts, people with disabilities. Jesus is saying none of those circumstances is evidence of God's rejection. It's not. Now, I don't know what your reaction was when we first read the, the parable. I realize that it sounds a little bit harsh. You know, that ending, that ending is harsh, right? The host says, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. And when I, when I first started studying it this week, I got to the end there and I was like, ooh, ouch. This is a scary parable. But... I've come to realize this parable is so much more about grace than it is harsh, right? Because the only people in the parable who are left out of the banquet are the people who don't want to be there. 
Right? What is more gracious than that? So, what does this parable mean for us? It was spoken to the Pharisees to warn them that they were in danger of missing out on the heavenly banquet. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I making any of the same mistakes as the Pharisees? Now, the biggest mistake that they made was that when God in the flesh came to them, they rejected him, right? They chose their own kingdoms over God's kingdom. So the parable challenges us to ask the question, how am I responding to Jesus? How am I responding to Jesus? Through Jesus, God invites us to his banquet, invites us into his kingdom, invites us into relationship with him. How do you respond to that invitation? I know that our circumstances are not quite like the Pharisees, right? We don't have Jesus in the flesh standing before us doing miracles and that sort of thing. But I do believe that Jesus extends the invitation to God's banquet to each one of us every day in a myriad of ways. And if we're listening, if we're paying attention, we can hear it. But so often, as that invitation comes to us, we end up making excuses. Excuses that often are just as lame as the people in the parable. You know, excuses why we can't be bothered to think about God or to pray or to participate in a church or to participate in any kind of ministry. We got other things to do. And I hear this parable saying, don't let your life go by without attending to God. Don't let your life go by without responding to Jesus. Don't let your life life go by without seeking the kingdom of God rather than your own kingdom, your own glory. When you sense God's invitation in your life, don't say, I wish I could, God, but I don't want to. Today, if you hear God's invitation, the invitation to come to his table and be part of his family, the invitation to turn from your own kingdom and turn toward his, say yes. Say yes. Don't distract yourself from that voice with another show on Netflix or another scroll of the social media feed. Take the time to to hear from God, to get alone, to pray and say, Lord, I accept your invitation. Help me to live like a citizen of your kingdom. Help me to feast at your banquet. I'll close with a quote that I think fits well. This is from a book called Love Does by Bob Goff, um, which I would definitely recommend. He says, there is only one invitation it would kill me to refuse. Yet I'm tempted to turn it down all the time. I get the invitation every morning when I wake up to actually live a life of complete engagement, a life of whimsy, a life where love does. It, meaning the invitation, doesn't come in an envelope. It's ushered in by a sunrise, the sound of a bird, the smell of coffee drifting lazily from the kitchen. It's the invitation to actually live to fully participate in this amazing life for one more day. Nobody turns down an invitation to the White House, but I've seen plenty of people turn down an invitation to fully live. Turning down this invitation comes in a lot of flavors. It looks like numbing yourself or distracting yourself or seeing something really beautiful as normal. It can also look like refusing to forgive or not being grateful or getting wrapped around the axle with fear or envy. I think every day God sends us an invitation to live. And sometimes we forget to show up or get head faked into thinking we haven't really been invited. But you see, we have been invited every day all over again. Let's pray. Lord, 
we recognize today that you invite us to your table. You invite us into your family. And you do that through Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us not to make excuses, not to turn away from the invitation, but to receive it, to respond, and to start experiencing what, it, what it's like to live as citizens of your kingdom rather than just our own kingdoms. Lord, if there's any of us here uh, who have never responded to the invitation, Lord, I just pray that we would feel the tug on our hearts and that we would respond. Grant us understanding, Lord. Help us to see this parable the way you want us to see it. In Jesus' name, amen. In the holy war of God risen Watch the waters part before us now Come and see what He has done for us Tell the world His great love Our God is the God who saves our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever He reigns now and forever His enemies will run for sure The church will stand, she will endure He holds the keys of life, our Lord, death has no sting, the final word, our God is a God who saves, and our God is a God who saves, let God arise, let God arise, our God now and forever He reigns now and forever God arise Let God arise Our God reigns now and forever He reigns now and forever Now is the point in our service where we continue our worship through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Here at St. Paul's, we invite you to participate in this. Um, and the only requirement is that you are saying yes to Jesus' invitation uh, to follow him, to believe in him. Uh, and, you know, it's perfect that we celebrate this right after talking about that parable, uh, because one of the ways that we express that we want to come to God's banquet is by participating in this sacred act of remembrance. So I encourage you to, to think of it that way as you receive today, um, that you are saying yes, that Jesus has come, invited you to God's banquet, invited you to God's family, and this is the way that you are expressing, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be like the Pharisees who weren't interested in coming. I don't want to be the, like the Pharisees who were all fixated on building their own kingdoms rather than being part of God's kingdom. I want to come to the party. Um, because of COVID, we're doing individual communion cups. Uh, if you didn't receive one, 
on the way in and you'd like to participate, please raise your hand and Caleb can bring you on. And, um, you know, if you have questions, if you don't understand exactly what this is all about, this following Jesus and believing in Jesus stuff, um, I encourage you to set up a time to meet with me or Keith uh, to talk about it. We would love to talk more about what that's all about. Let's stand together and say the prayer of confession. <laughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. Through endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. At break of dawn The Son of Heaven rose again O oh, trample death Where is your sting? The angels roar For Christ the King His name forevermore Through endless days we will sing your praise O Lord, O Lord our God He 
shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Thank you for being with us. We got one more. Thank you for standing too. It's awesome. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now. I'm found, was blind, but now I see. There's grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believe My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy reigns Unending love Amazing The Lord has promised good to me His word my hope secured He will my shield and portion be As long as life endures My chains are gone I've been saved my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. An end in love, amazing grace. earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine 
you are forever mine my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns and then Amazing grace And like a flood His mercy reigns An end in love Amazing grace Amen. Well, thank you again so much for being here today and for those who were watching on live stream. Thank you for watching. Um, we encourage you to stick around, hang out, uh, get to know some people. We still have uh, coffee and refreshments outside. And uh, it's outdoors because when you're outdoors, you're not required to wear the mask. So I encourage you to, to stay and, and talk for a while. Let's say our benediction. While our service here has now ended, our worship has not ended. Because our worship never ends. Now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen.